All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome to Backyard Beekeeping. I'm Don Kogan and I've been working with honeybees for the last 15 years. Uh, and with me today is my colleague and dear friend, Mary Eckblad. Uh, we are both contact teachers at IDEA in the Fairbanks office and we're both beekeepers. And so today uh, we're going to share the fascinating world of honeybees with you and how you can have a, a honey beehive in your own backyard. I just want to say good morning to everybody. Thank you so much for coming and being a part of our virtual workshop. We just uh, want to thank everybody who's um, given time and help, um, the Javier's and Elijah, um, Kirsten Emmett and our videographer, um, all that have helped us. We're learning technology and learning things. So you may need to be a little patient with us this morning because um, we're just trying to learn how to do a virtual webinar today. Um, so honey beekeeping is so great. It's so important to learn. It's great life skill. Um, you know, we're trying to be more sustainable now um, and using our own resources in our backyard. So, um, learning about honeybees, teaching your kids about honeybees, so important, so important for our environment because honeybees really help our environment um, with pollination. So, um, yeah, thanks for coming out with us this morning for this hour. And we are just excited to talk about honeybees with you today. So, welcome. Yes, welcome. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is share a Prezi with you about the world of honeybees. So bees of all kinds belong uh can you see the powerpoint mary yeah if you could blow it up don it would be better i see copy there you let's see i think it's getting there okay how about this hold on you see it now yep i i see it it's right. kind of small okay so Bees of all kinds belong to the order of insects known as Hymenoptera, literally main wings. This order, comprising of 100,000 species, all includes wasps, ants, ichneumons, and sawflies. In about 2500 BC, people created cave paintings of bee hunting. And ancient hives were made of and clay. In 50 BC, Romans began melting and dyeing beeswax. During the Middle Ages, from 500 to AD, beekeepers started wearing protections such as bees were kept in skeps. And skeps are these little baskets over here. Those have now uh, become illegal because they're very difficult to affect for. Then during the 1600s, honeybees were imported to America by the pilgrims. Thank you, pilgrims. In the 1850s, Lorenzo Langstroth invented the movable frame hive, which made it easy to inspect all parts of the beehive and make sure that the bees are healthy and they have what they need. Then, unfortunately, in the 1950s, biologists in Brazil altered and bred European and African honeybees, which accidentally escaped, creating the Africanized bee that has spread in many parts of North and South America. Now we'll talk a little bit about the varieties available and uh, varieties are uh, used by people in, a, in all around Alaska. This is the Italian. Then the, see how she's a little bit darker? 
And then we have the Russian. She's the darkest bee and the most aggressive. She forages way earlier in the morning and later into the evening. And then there's the buck fast that was a man-made strain from Europe. And just so you know, you're less likely to die from a, an Africanized bee sting than you are from a falling coconut. If you're ever out in the wild and you see honeycomb like this hanging off of a tree unprotected, it's likely to be an Africanized colony. So you want to be careful and, and beware. And this is what the Africanized colony would look like if, if it um, had its live bees on it. And this is a map showing where Africanized bees have spread in our country. You can see even the northern parts of California, Nevada, and Utah don't have the Africanized uh, bees yet. And thankfully, Alaska doesn't either. Okay, now Miss Mary is going to share with us about the anatomy of honeybees. So Miss Mary, <clears throat> take it away. Okay, so our slides are a little later than what we're um, we're talking about. So I'm going to wait till that slideshow gets up there for for the anatomy um, and the work, the the jobs of honeybees. <clears throat> so honeybees are amazing. They all have jobs. They all have um, specific um, specializations in the colony, um, and um, I don't know if you can get that Prezi up there. It comes. So um, I'm going to talk about <clears throat> the jobs, and then Don's going to talk about the anatomy. Okay, so the honeybee colony <clears throat> is like a family, and it consists of a single mother of the queen, thousands of daughters or the workers, and a variety, <clears throat> a numbering of sons or the drones. The tree casts, um, the queen, worker, and drone, they differ in their size and their shape, and each specialized performs certain tasks within the colony. The specialization and conse um, consequent interdependence of the castes make the honey colony a truly like social unit, like a family. <clears throat> so there's a picture of the queen. All right, the queen has one very important job and that is to breed. Um, she stays in the hive and she's cared for by her daughters and she is the only female in the colony that breeds. A very interesting thing about our queenie is that she actually puts out a pheromone <clears throat> that prevents all the other females from reaching maturity. So she can ensure that she is the only one that breeds in her colony. So very, very important that we have healthy queens in our colonies. Um, <clears throat> and uh, she's, the, she's the only one. So um, the next we're going to talk about is called the drones. <clears throat> okay, so the drones are the male bees, and their only job really is to mate with the queen. So they are larger than the worker bees, um, and they have stocky bodies. Like if you look into the hive, you can see they're really stocky um, bees. Um, <clears throat> and I guess they do have a function to help keep the hive warm. So that's really important. <clears throat> So when they're no longer needed, <clears throat> they are forced out of the hive and they die. So kind of kind of sad, the life of the drone. But they're all interdependent, so the drone is very important. Um, you can see it's stockier body there. <clears throat> um, take a quick, make sure that you're looking at these as you're looking um, and observing these. <clears throat> Thank you, Elijah. I have definitely got a sore throat today. <clears throat> um, just notice kind of the anatomy because we're going to do some art at the end. So if you can kind of keep um, and be observing that, that would be good. <clears throat> this is our worker bee, okay? She is super important <clears throat> to the colony. Um, the worker bees are female and they are really only ones that do the work in the colony. <clears throat> the worker bees actually perform different tasks according to their age. Um, for the first few weeks of their lives, they stay and do the work in the hive. They keep the hive clean, they tend to 
and they feed the larva and they take care of that important queen. After that, they leave the hive to forage and bring back the nectar and the pollen. <clears throat> the pollen is the protein food that is necessary for the development of those little baby bees. Okay, so the worker bee is really important. <clears throat> they feed the larva, they build new wax combs, they do all the capping of the brood and the honey cells, they process nectar and pollen for the storage of the honey, they, they feed, they are doing the feeding. They feed the queens, they feed the drones, and you'll notice that with their um, large, um, just in the different anatomy of um, the bees. They also do all the cleaning. <clears throat> they remove the debris and material from the hive. Um, they spend a lot of time ventilating the, the colony and they defend the colony. So <clears throat> those worker bees are very important. <clears throat> One thing I love about worker bees, I think is just a really interesting little fact. Um, when they're about a week old, what they do is they go out of the hive and they do these short like little orientations or play flights where they, they come out and they kind of hover around the hive and they, they, they're hovering, they're doing like a hovering motion and they're getting an orientation to their home and where they are. And so when they start taking the longer flights, they go out and they, they can know where they're supposed to come back to. And it's really neat because they're learning more and more about the hives and more and more about bees. And they come back in, these little bees, and they spend some time resting in the hive after they've done their little orientation flights. So I think that's just super neat. There's so many amazing things about the, the social order to a beehive. Um, and they're all interdependent, so they need all three, the queen, the worker, and the drones. So that's a that's a really beautiful thing about the colony. Just like we need each other um, in our family units, everybody's important. The same thing for our colonies and for our bees. So if one part of it gets sick or diseased, it affects the whole colony. So um, Don is gonna tell you a little bit now about um, the anatomy of the bees. Okay, so can you see my uh, PowerPoint slide here with the bee heads? Okay, great. So up at the top is the queen and you notice that uh, sh her eyes are about the same shape and size the worker. And you see she's got those three little uh, cell eyes at the top of her head, just like the worker. Well, look at the drone. Look at how different the drone is. His eyes are much bigger and his acellus eyes are on his the face rather than the top. And there's one really big uh, difference between these and that's that the worker has a much longer proboscis, which is the tongue. Can you say proboscis for me? I know I can't hear you, but uh, your mom and, or maybe your dad can hear you. It's, it's proboscis, that's the tongue and that's what the honeybee worker uses to forage and to get the nectar out of the flowers. And um, so let's move on here. This is the end of the, and at the bottom there, you see the little wax glands, they're gray. And the neatest thing is once their glands start secreting wax, they put out a thin layer of wax on these, these, these thin, um, they're like little, um, let's just say sheets or, uh, and, and when the wax dries, the, the wax comes off in like flakes and that's how they build the, the honeycomb is these thin sheets of wax. Here's the wings and, um, they're connected by this hook here. And the wings are really important to bees so that they can fly and, and forage for nectar and pollen and tree sap and water. And they also use the wings to evaporate the honey. Believe it or not, they won't seal the honey in, in the cells, the wax, until it's exactly 17% moisture, moisture content. Now here's the legs. Legs are really important too. And you know those pollen sacs that the you see full of yellow and green and different colors of pollen? Well, 
there's a hinge right here. Can you see the hinge? And that's what the bee uses to keep packing the pollen sac full and, and as full as possible. So you know when you take the trash out, you always push the trash down so you can get more trash in it before you remove the bag? Well, that's what the bee is doing with its leg there. And then here's an up close picture. See how the pollen is coming in in a little bit a little bit at a time and then it gets bigger and bigger and it's that hinge that allows the bee to keep packing it in into a bulging pollen sac and finally look at all of the the um, organs on the inside of that little tiny bee. takes all of these organs for the bee to do all of its jobs right out front here this is a pump and that allows the bee to actually use it it's proboscis like a straw and to suck up the nectar and to start digesting it. Then the honey travels in and it gets stored in this honey stomach and it's digested. And then when it, it's actually the nectar that comes in as a liquid and then it starts changing in the, in the gut of the bee and then the bee regurgitates it out. Sorry to say, but when you eat honey, you're eating bee vomit. And the best for beekeeping in Alaska right now is beekeeping in Eastern Canada. On now to a video that was recorded by uh, the Emmett family, who's an idea family. And we will access that right here one thing <clears throat> one thing about this video is that um we videoed it outside on a very windy day um and so some of our audio is a little um uh it's a little distorted but we just hope you enjoyed this video we hope it works because it's technology but um we did have a little bit of wind that day because we so here's us hiving So welcome to Backyard Beekeeping with Mary Eckblad and Don Kogan. <laughs> and we're here to, to tell you what we know about keeping bees in the interior of Alaska. I started working with bees when my daughter had pollen allergies and I got a gallon of honey from the farmer's market here in Fairbanks and I gave her a teaspoon a day for a whole year. And Lo and behold, the next summer, she was able to play outside with her friends, work in the garden with us, and I realized I better learn how to keep bees. So here we are. We're going to teach you some things about keeping bees in your own backyard. I've been keeping bees for 15 years, and about 13 years ago, I started teaching classes every spring. And since then, there's been a lot of families learning how to to produce their own honey and create products like lotion bars and lip balms. And um, it's just a great way to be self-sustainable. Well, how did you get involved in beekeeping? I got involved with beekeeping because this is one of my best friends or my best friend is Don Kogan. And she has a real love for beekeeping and all things wonderful. And so, um, just watching her do the hives and just, I love science too. And um, beekeeping is just amazing watching science come alive. Um, so I've loved it. I've loved beekeeping. We've had some amazing uh, years with lots of honey. Um, one summer, um, the like the second summer of beekeeping, um, we actually had a swarm, which is like when your bees leave the hive um, and we had an incident. And, I was just so amazed at how the power of the hive when they when they came roaring out of that hive and they yeah. like they circled around and they had this like interesting group think and then they left but so I think bees are just fascinating creatures and we're just so excited that we can come to you today and share a little bit of our love for beekeeping with you. Welcome and we are just so excited to um, be with you today with Yes, we are. Beekeeping in the backyard. Yes. And I'd like to say, in, uh, before we get started, uh, 
that you can tell when your bees are happy and when they're angry or upset. And if you'll help me do that. Okay. Okay. And, and those of you that are watching, we'd like you to uh, join us as well. So this is how a happy colony sounds. And if they're really agitated, it sounds like this. So that's how you tell if the bees are happy or agitated. So here are the tools of the trade of beekeeping. So this is a hive tool. This is probably the most important tool because it helps us pry uh, open um, the lid and to separate the moving parts of the hive. And it's real sharp here so you can cut things on this end. You can use this extra finger um, when you're wearing gloves and you need uh, better dexterity. And you can also pry up uh, nails here. That's the hive tool. So here's the bee brush. This is a really important tool also because we can move bees very gently with it. And it helps us to move the bees off of us after doing hive checks. We use a pair of scissors to cut insulation and the bee box to recycle different parts of the bee bus. This is a frame grip, and the frame grip actually helps us to pull the frames up out of the hive because once again, um, when you're wearing gloves, you don't have as good a dexterity. So it's like little fine fingers to grab the frames with. This is a frame holder, and this is where we set the frames on once we're removing them from the box to try to look for the queen or to inspect the hive for disease and locate eggs, larvae, and the pupa. And one last thing is a ratchet strap. For ratchet strapping all the parts of the hive together, all the boxes and the lid and the bottom board, so that if they get bumped by a moose or a human, they don't fall over. And that is the end of the tools of the trade. So it's really important that you wear protective gear when you're beekeeping because over time bees have gotten a lot more aggressive and uh, while beekeeping is a great hobby and it's a great way to um, get raw local honey and all the other resources that bees provide for us, uh, they also can sting. And when one stings, then others sense those pheromones and they come and they sting. So we want to make sure that you understand that you need to protect yourself. So we wear a full body suit with gloves and uh, we wear rubber boots on our feet and there's elastic at the wrists and at the ankles to, so that the bees can't come in because if they find one little tiny hole they'll come in and these veils are really important too because it keeps the bees off of our skin if i didn't have this holding the veil out and it, the veil touched my face the, the bees would sting me right through the screen so that's important. And it's nice to have a, a partner when you're beekeeping because um, doing it by yourself, I think it's a lot more safe and fun to have a yeah. partner. So if Dawn was gonna go to take off her bee suit, she's gonna be covered with bees here. Mm -hmm. So I would be using this little bee brush and I'd be helping her get the bees off a little bit because it's very important that you're watching, even when you're taking protective gear off, where the bees are. Yes. And then, Another very important part of beekeeping in Alaska is keeping your bees warm in the spring and in the fall. So how we do that is we have uh, two different types of lids. Here's the outer telescoping lid and it has an, an inch of insulation on the inside. And then the, there's the inner lid. And then even inside here, 
there's inner insulation on both sides. So one of these um, insulator boards on each side of the hive. So there's outer insulation and inner insulation. And there's just a honeycomb. Uh, how do you keep it insulated from the outside? Well, you take this, wrap it around, yep, and then you have a stapler. It's a wrap. Take this sugar can out. Good hive tool. Set the sugar can aside. And incidentally, each of the boxes of bees have a number mm -hmm. on them. And that's how we track the queen. And then at the end of the season, we use the data to uh, figure out which line, which genetic line of queens is uh, a better layer, a better producer. And right now we're locating the queen cage and there she is and she's crawling around in there and I can tell that she's alive and well one reason is because her worker bees are crawling all over her cage they want her to get out and start laying eggs so would you put this in your pocket sure. Mary? and just keep her warm and safe and then we put the sugar can back in. Give them a little brush. Watch out, girls. You don't want to smash them if we can help it. I'm blowing on them to get them to move out of the way. Now, I'm going to open the bee bus. starting to come out. You see them? This is...
this block right out in front here. Recycling this bee bus to do that. Okay, now would you like to put the queen in? See, it has a cap on it. So before we t before we slide it on here, we're going to take the cap off. And there's some sugar candy in there, and the bees, the workers, will eat that sugar candy. And then as soon as they can get in and the queen can get out, the queen will crawl out and start laying eggs. She comes already bred and she can lay up to 2,000 eggs a day for up to seven years. How many eggs could she potentially lay in her lifetime? I'll let you do that math. The queen is so important to this hive. So they know their queen because they've been riding up here with them. stay warm and be loved and cherished by her colony. So the pollen patty has uh, wax paper over the top to keep it fresh so that it doesn't dry out as fast, but we need to cut an X in it to expose more of the pollen so that more bees will be able to eat because their proboscis, which is their tongue, isn't able to get through the wax paper very easily. So um, kind of open it up a little bit and we're going to put any extra space all on one side. is we give them essential oils. This is called Honey Bee Healthy, and it has things like spearmint and lemon balm, things like that. Um, so I'll give it a little shake, and Miss Mary can put the funnel in, and, and we'll put about maybe a teaspoon or two, or up to four at this initial feeding. Yeah. And some of the bees will get jump in there because they're so eager to have the food uh, but they're able to crawl out because there's little ladders in there for them there's a ladder in there yeah that is so cool and we want this lid to have a, a hole in the front so that the air can, can flow through girls one thing we really would like is if you in the chat box would name our queen bee today so what would be some fun names that you would like to name this queen and at the end of the workshop we will name choose a name for our queen bee maybe you'd like a, a name like 
Um, Queen For Tilda. For Tilda. <laughs> no. <laughs> Queen Elizabeth. Yeah. So anyway, that would be really fun if you would name our queen that's going to be out here in this hive. So thanks. So thank you for joining us for Backyard Beekeeping. There's a whole lot more to know and to learn about bees and all the products that we get from them and all the things that they do. So I hope that you'll join us again for another workshop. Be happy. Okay, so let's, uh, we're, we're going to open it up right now for some questions. Are there any questions out there? Miss Mary will uh, look in the chat box and see if any of our students or parents have any questions. Doesn't look like anybody's putting any questions in there yet, but we would love for some interaction to happen. If you've seen anything so far that you have any questions about, um, you can type it in the chat um, box there. Um, so yeah, let us know. I see a couple hands raised. If you want to just put that, type that in, um, that would be really great for um, us to hear. So um, anyway. Melissa, Melissa Wohler and Michael Gustafson and Mindy Warren, they all have questions. Can you type your questions in the chat box? And Rebecca Morrow and um, Sally Endestad looks like she has a question. And okay. Wendy Prater. We have some questions. Wonderful. Okay, so um, let's just pick a few. Let's just pick a few questions here. I'll read the question. And Dawn, she's really the amazing uh, person that knows these things. So. Um, we've been having some um, some uh, questions here um, from Stephanie Powell. Can you explain more what you were doing with the funnel? Um, and where do you find supplies to start keeping your bees? Oh, these are great questions. The funnel keeps us from spilling sugar water in the hive because the bees, believe it or not, if they are, have um, any more than a quarter of an inch of standing water, they'll drown. And if they get oversaturated, they'll, they're, they don't do well. So uh, the funnel helps us to get it into the feeder and not to make a mess. And then um, there's lots of places around the country where you can get beekeeping supplies. Um, the ones that I use are Dadant, D-A-D-A-N-T. And um, incidentally, I, um, if you want um, to be on an email list, um, I can email you um, the answers to these questions. Today's, today's um, workshop is being recorded, so um, we can email you um, all the answers from today's workshop, um, as well as the PowerPoints and videos. Uh, so the Dant is one. Another one is called Man Lake, M-A-N-N-L-A-K-E. And then there's uh, Glory B, uh, G-L-O-R-Y-B-E-E. -E. And uh, let's, let's go to the next question. Thank you, Stephanie and Evelina, for your questions today. So we were having a little bit of audio glitches that people wanted us to, to know. We are learning our technology, so. Thank you for your patience. Um, one question that is really out there a lot is, what is the problem with the Africanized bees? Um, and can you tell us more about the Africanized bees? Oh, okay. Well, Africanized bees are a lot more aggressive and their venom is, is a lot more potent than just an average honeybee. And the problem is, is that queens prefer the semen, which is the genetics, you know, the DNA of Africanized drones. So a lot of our honeybees that we uh, bring into warm or into colder climates like Alaska um, actually have the genetics, some, some percentage of the genetics of the Africanized drone because the queens prefer them. So when they're mating with up to 21 drones in the air, um, they prefer those Africanized drones. And um, when we get them, they're already bred because queens are only fertile in the first three days of their life. 
And after that, three to five days, and then they'd crawl into the hive and they stay with their, their babies until they die. And queens can live up to seven years, like we talked about before. So um, they lay up to 2,000 eggs a day. Well, if you have, um, you know, a 13 to 15,000 bees, which is the number of bees that you saw in the video uh, of us hiving, by, by uh, fall, there's 100 to 120, maybe 80, 80,000 to 120,000 bees. And all of our bees are getting more and more aggressive because of the Africanized genetics. Any other questions? Well, Laura Martin says, why weren't you wearing gloves, Dawn? Um, she says, no gloves for your, um, and um, <clears throat> I'll just talk about that. <clears throat> I use gloves because um, I'm a little bit more leery and Dawn's been working with bees a lot longer. Um, and so it's really hard to do that intricate work with the queen, like you saw us doing with our bulky gloves on. Um, and so the, they're, they're very excited to get into their hive the day of the hiving. Um, like I was asking to her, why don't you have your gloves on? And she's like, they're really eager to get into the hive, but generally we always have our hive gloves on at all times but when you're working with the queen that initial time with the queen you've got all the little things and we don't want her to fall um <clears throat> we were working around ice that day and snow and so we just wanted she wanted to be very careful with the queen so i hope that answers your question laura um christina asks is it just plain water that you poured into the hive um so maybe you can talk about that a little bit don that's an excellent question. I noticed while watching the video myself that I needed to explain why we're feeding bees. Well, we don't have pollen and nectar here in Alaska for several weeks from the beginning of April until, you know, mid-May. Um, the first thing they actually are able to get in the natural environment is the willow from the willow tree and the spruce tree and then the birch trees. Um, before we see dandelions, that's about it, and it, it, it's limited. So we have to give them sugar water, and the ratio of that sugar water is one cup of sugar to one cup of water. And it's um, the pollen is uh, um, something else that we get shipped in from other beekeepers in, in at those stores that we talked about. And so we only feed them for a few weeks. And as soon as we see a bunch of dandelions, we pull the feeder out and put more frames in and we pull the insulation out as it gets warmer. This coming weekend, we're expecting the temperatures to increase to around the mid 70s here in Fairbanks. So we'll be pulling insulation out and increasing the size of the entrance and getting ready to pull the feeders out and, and we won't have to give them pollen anymore either. They'll do all of their own foraging on their own. Okay, so I think because we do have uh, several uh, more things to do and we wanna make sure that we get to them, uh, what I would like to have you do is email me your questions, uh, don.cogan, that's D-A-W-N dot Kogan, C-O-G-A-N, at ideafamilies.org and I will email them, email answers out to everyone. Okay, and so let's move on to the next activity here. And we can also tell you later about some of the ideas for the, the naming our queen. We've got some great names, Dawn. I mean, really, oh. some really, okay, really cool well, can ones. Yeah, at the end, let's hear those, okay? Okay. So, honeybees, did you know that honeybees are some of nature's finest mathematicians? They really? calculate angles. They comprehend the roundness of the earth. They build and thrive in one of the most mathematically efficient architectural designs around. Here are some geometric shapes. Can those, uh, can our students, say the names of those shapes with me square hey don circle. i think we're just a second we're still stuck on the um the picture of the queen here okay. on mine let's see if we got the other 
a PowerPoint back up. Okay, hold on. Let's see. Thank you for um, your patience with us as we learn our technology here. Okay. I don't want this one. Okay. One question that I'll say during while we get our video, what I, our PowerPoint going is that um, it is possible to um, winter their bees over. It's a real process though, and that's a good another workshop to talk about. So, um, but we want to talk about how they build their hives and the math behind it. It's just fascinating. So, can you come? Okay, Don, it's working. Okay, so here's geometric shapes. Can you see them with me? Square, circle, triangle, and what's that one? The hexagon, right? All right. Now, I want to teach you a new vocabulary word. It's called tessellate. Can you say tessellate? Yes. Things that, uh, sp shapes that tessellate um, fit together with no spaces. And so this is a tessellation. Is this a tessellation? Yes, it is. Is this a tessellation? Oh, see the spaces in there? No, that's not a tessellation. How about this one? Do these shapes fit together with no spaces? Yes, it's a tessellation. Okay, Miss Mary, can you tell us about the smoker? That's one of the tools we uh, did not include in our video earlier. So yeah, we sh we didn't use the smoker, but that is a really important tool that um, we use quite a bit when we're doing beekeeping. And um, we need, do we have the picture of that, Dawn, in our slideshow? Yes. Um, we can you see it in the PowerPoint? Okay. Let we me. actually had a little bit of a technology glitch there back there. So everybody, thank you for your patience with us because um, we did lose some of our technology. But you know what, we were talking about protective gear. This is super important with beekeeping is everybody, if you wanna get into beekeeping, you need to have the right gear um, for beekeeping. It's very, very important. And you'll see at the bottom of the screen there, it's a, a little tool called the smoker. And the smoker is very important because when the bees get agitated, you know, that high that we were telling you about, you can actually sedate them and calm them down by using that um, tool called the smoker. And what that does is that um, bees don't like the smoke. Um, they inhale the smoke and it makes them drowsy. They eat honey. They'll start gorging their little selves on honey and eating the honey frantically. And it actually, their bodies swell and they become like stiff. Um, and that honey makes their body stiff and so they can't sting you. So the smoker is very important. Um, we use it now and then when it's like a hot day when we're hiving and it's a little warm because they don't like it when you hive when it's hot. Um, sometimes we'll use the smoker and then they can't. It sedates them and it also, they, they gorge themselves on the honey, which we like honey too. Um, but it makes it so that it's harder for them to, to sting us. So thank you, Miss Mary. And so um, let's see here. So are there any more questions? And um, go ahead and type them in the chat box. So Don, one of the technical issues that Elijah is working on right now, everybody uh -huh. is that we had a technical difficulty and I can see um, that people have questions, but I can't get to the questions. So we're gonna have to answer the questions by sending you emails later. So keep asking the questions for us and we're gonna definitely answer those for you, all of those questions, but I can't see those questions. He's- um, Okay, no problem. So um, there's a few handouts, as you can see in your um, platform here. There's the PowerPoint that we were sharing. Also, there's the members of the hive, which is this um, image. Can you see that, Mary? Yes. 
Okay. So um, let's see. Hold on just a second. All right. Now we're going to scroll this down. All right. So there's the queen, the worker, and the drone. And um, you can download these today before you leave the workshop area. This right here, the honey files of bees life, it's incredible. You definitely want to have this uh, unit study if you're wanting to teach your children more about bees and beekeeping. It is wonderful. It has, um, it has crossword puzzles and, and biology and math and it's a STEAM unit study for our students. Um, you can see it's 98 pages long. It's got vocabulary words and diagramming. It's awesome. Let's go back to the members of the hive. And um, it is now 10 o'clock. And I'm going to just spend a couple more minutes um, working on a little art project that you can finish at home. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take a drawing tool and I'm gonna draw an egg because you know, honeybees, they, are, they have a complete metamorphosis. They start out as an egg and the workers take 21 days to um, change from an egg all the way to an adult. So we have the egg and then we have the larva and it gets a little bit bigger like this. And the larva is segmented like this. And then we have the pupa. And inside that hexagon cell, the larva gets sealed with wax. And we'll fill that with wax, OK? And then you have the adult. And the adult. I'm going to use the black line over here to the left to draw a worker. The worker's head is almost like a triangle upside down. And then it has a thorax, and then it has an abdomen. And remember, its eyes are out here on the side. And then it has the three little oscillus eyes here at the top of its head. and what else does it have? Well, it has stripes, right? Those black stripes on the abdomen. And it has a little stinger, but the stinger is hidden up inside of its body until it wants to sting, and then the stinger comes out. And then it has wings. And the wings would kind of look like this. And then it has antlers, right? It has antlers and antennas, not antlers. Goodness gracious, antennas. See, um, teachers make mistakes too sometimes, and we learn from them, but we keep going. So then it has six legs. How many body parts do you see? One, two, three. So let's say that meta, the stages of the metamorphosis together. Egg, larva, pupa, adult. Can you say that with me? Egg, larva, pupa, adult. OK, so now um, we are going to finish up by saying that I hope that you'll uh, come and do some more workshops with Miss Mary and I and our staff here at the IDEA office. IDEA does uh, help families purchase the bee equipment as well as pay for the classes and all the protective gear and the bees. So if you want to do that, just talk to your contact teacher and we'll, we'll um, teach you how to um, do that. And then also, uh, if you have any questions, please email me, dawn.cogan at ideafamilies.org. And I hope that you found today's workshop to be fun and engaging and um, that you'll make use of the resources here. If you have any questions, please contact us. Our phone number is 907-374-2200. And we are currently enrolling new students. Thank you very much for joining us today for Backyard Beekeeping. Thank you, everybody.
Have a great day.